Hey, thanks for stopping by Minnesota Black Robe Regiment. Make sure you are subscribed. I found a, and Carrie, you, y'all can see Carrie sitting there. Carrie knows this. Somehow YouTube has found a way to unsubscribe people and make it feel oh, like yes. you. <laughs> I, I don't know why they're doing it to me, but they are. But I have Carrie from Unsafe Space here. She has so graciously allowed herself some time to sit down with me. I, her life has been, I don't know, a little busy. It's, she may or may not have gotten <laughs> married in the last week. Um, so, so here she sits. Carrie is... Uh, she is the voice and the face of unsafe space uh, that we wish we could see more of instead of Carter. And I told her. <laughs> and, uh, is this and, a roast of Carter? <laughs> I, no, I told Carter? I told Carter that when he when he sat down with me, I says, I'm just l- looking forward to getting carry on because most people would rather look at her than you, Carter. So he, he knows he knows I was going to say that. So. But anyway, uh, just, Carrie, Carrie is an interesting animal. Um, Carrie spent years as a social justice uh, careerist. And uh, and then she met Carter. So I want first, I, I need to know how you and Carter got connected because Carter started Unsafe Space by himself. Yes. So Carter and I met actually when I worked in the entertainment industry. He... Uh, had his fingers in a lot of pots. I don't know how to say it. He was doing a lot of different things. He And briefly for a time, he was uh, working in may, probably maybe tangentially in the entertainment industry. My business partner was a music manager. I was a comedy manager. I worked with comedians and um, and was a producer. But my business partner was a music manager And I met him in Austin at South by Southwest, the music festival, where you do a lot of meetings and stuff there. And and we were talking about him possibly working with one of our uh, one of our musicians at the time, someone on our roster um, and in a business capacity. And so I met him that way and we just became acquaintances. And the way that you do in a lot of a lot of industries, I'm sure, not just entertainment, but especially entertainment at the time. And, and probably still today, you would add people on social media so that you stay connected to them somehow in case you work together in the future. You would just add people to your network, so to speak. Yeah. And maybe in the way that people do on LinkedIn today. And so we, I added him and, and uh, a few years later, he was working for, in another field, he was working uh, with a sex toy company. And he, I was representing- I, asked, I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I represented, one of the comedians I represented at the time was Margaret Cho, who does quite a bit of sex related content. And so he, and I also worked with a comedian named Sarah Benincasa, who did a lot of sex related content. So he got in touch and wanted to know if they would review some of the products. So he started sending me sex toys. <laughs> That's how, I don't think we've ever talked about this. <laughs> For my you clients. Here, folks, end, end of conversation. <laughs> this will be worth millions of views. This has gone viral already. So. <laughs> so, yeah. So he sent those to me for my clients and they reviewed some of them. I think Sarah reviewed some. I don't know if Margaret ever did the reviews, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's that. Then we were still just loosely connected online, uh, but we weren't, I wouldn't say we were friends. It's like you have a lot of people who are just work acquaintances. And then a few years later, when I started leaving my ideology, I started leaving social justice, the nature of my posts on social media changed. Um, before, when I was in social justice for so long, all of my social media posts were either work related, they were related to somehow to my business, to my comedians, to promoting shows, to promoting my artists, or they were social justice in nature. So uh, a lot of posts about sexism and misogyny and internalized racism, or, you know, even in the, before the 2016 election, I was doing posts about Trump and misogyny, you know. And, and in 2016, 2017 is when I started leaving that cult of belief. It was a pretty long transition. It wasn't a quick overnight thing. And he got in touch. So that's how, anyway, that's how we, he got in touch. So So, a lot of friends I lost then, but he, I gained him as a friend. He was something like, he noticed, he noticed, he saw that. And that's what, you know, 
a lot of people you don't pay attention to pay, pay attention to on social media and all of a sudden something will happen and you'll be like mm, what's going on here um by by the way carter you and your straight lace image straight out the window now by the way you know <laughs> you're <laughs> with, always with your button-up shirts and your and your fancy ties on and and everybody out there now this is awesome so <laughs> <laughs> well, Carter's, you know, he's an anarcho-capitalist, like sort of loosely uh, related to libertarians, if you haven't heard that phrase before, but oh, it's yeah. different. And that's and what he and I talked about was anarcho-capitalism and volunteerism and individualism. So. so he's all about, you know, your right to to do like he also has worked with some uh, marijuana businesses. And yeah, he's got his he's not a straight laced. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I know. Um, so, Carrie, you you brought up the 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 aspect of leaving the social justice warrior mentality shortly after the 2016 election. It went, and it was a long kind of slow trudge for you. I know that you were raised ostensibly race Christian. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you end up in the social justice warrior uh, camp? How does how does a, a a young lady go off to college and and I we all know the answer to this but I want you to explain it so people can understand one that it could happen to their own kids oh yeah two it doesn't mean the end is near how does yeah. that happen how do you get into that when when you get get out there on your own uh, I well I went to Duke University in in uh 1996 to 2000 so aging myself a bit quite a while ago and i was indoctrinated then and it's only gotten worse since then it's now it's not just in the elite universities anymore now it's in elementary school so a lot of times people are encountering it at a younger age than i did even they're being indoctrinated when they're in high school or middle school mm -hmm. but um how did i get into it I think that it appeals especially to people. There's two different types of people who get into it, roughly speaking. There's the very good, well-intentioned people, people with a big heart. Um, some parents I've talked to whose kids have fallen into it, I ask, does she have a big heart? Yes. <laughs> and that I know that. I know that. It appeals to people with a big heart. It appeals to people's sense of empathy, um, people who are open-minded, yep. almost open-minded to a to fault. fault. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and then on the other hand, there's also people who are very ill intentioned in it. People who see it as an opportunity to abuse and to gain power and to oppress and to harm others. There's both types of people in it. And the people with good intent who fall into it, they fall for the lies. They fall for what it sells itself as. It sells itself as this belief system that's about ending oppression and about ending racism and sexism and uh, about being a good person. I think also people can fall into it if they don't have a strong system of belief already. So I was I was not a Christian when I when I got to Duke. I had left the belief system behind that I was raised with and I was really sort of an open vessel at that point of, you know, looking for without realizing it looking for a way to interpret the world and to, a, a system of belief with which to regard the world and help make sense of the world and it functions a lot like a religion in that way it gives you this this meta narrative of oppression and the oppressed and it tells you here's how to be a good person is you repeat these things you believe these things and it and it sucks you in slowly a lot of people think you have to be stupid to fall into a cult or into a cult of belief, but that's not true. There's a lot of intelligent people who who speak social justice, and th there were intelligent people. If you if you look at any kind of cult, like like Heaven's Gate, there were a lot of really smart people in Heaven's Gate. It, um, yeah, those people were sharp. They yeah, it's really IQ is just Carter often says that. IQ is if you have if you have a high IQ, it's like having a really nice engine in your car. So if you're on the wrong road, you're just going to get there faster. <laughs> so yeah. So so you I having been listening to you and Carter for a uh, 
decent amount of time, I know how you got into social justice because you have the big heart. You went into it because you cared and you wanted people to, to, to be right, to be well, to be treated fairly. Uh, did, do you think that the people that indoctrinated you into the, into the social justice mindset, do you think they knew that about you from talking to you and, and targeted you or, or was well, it not that nefarious? It's not that nefarious because it's everywhere, especially now, but then it was everywhere in the places I put myself. So it was in the nonprofits. I, I joined Amnesty International my first year in college. And that was the first time I took a, what they call dismantling racism training, which now would probably be called uh, something about like a toxic whiteness or uh, interrogating your white fragility or something. It was, it was that sort of critical race theory uh, struggle session. So I took that through Amnesty International. I was a women's studies minor. So it's, it's riddled with it. Women's studies is part of it. Women's studies, which is now called gender studies, but as part of that minor, I took queer studies classes, I took critical race theory classes, and it, it was it was thoroughly embedded in my field of study. Now it's even worse. Now flash forward more than 20 years, now it's in the hard sciences. I didn't have it, I didn't encounter it in my major, my major was biological anthropology and anatomy. I didn't encounter it in my science classes back then, but you will encounter it in your science classes now you will encounter it in your math classes now. It's everywhere. So it's not like they target you. I think I think the ideology itself is, I think it knows, I, I don't, I say it, I talk about it like it's a living thing, but the ideology itself is, the architects of this belief system have designed it in such a way where it, it appeals to people who want to do good and it masks itself as the opposite of what it is for that reason because it, it uses useful useful tools. So Brett, Brett Weinstein is a professor I really admire. And he's the professor from the Evergreen. Yep, Evergreen um, State. Evergreen controversy. And he did a lecture that I listened to a while back and it, it was called uh, How the Magic Trick is Done. And in that lecture, he talks about roughly two types of people in social justice. He calls them the bad actors and the useful tools. And I was a useful tool. And I, and I don't think that's unique to this ideology. I think bad ideology throughout history, throughout history has required both. Yeah. The bad actors and the useful tools. You need a lot of useful, some people call us, I was a useful idiot to some, well, <laughs> if you well, want to call me that. That, that yeah. was Lenin, Lenin said, like, you, you don't have to convince everybody that they have to believe this way. You just use the people that will believe that way. Yeah. And and that's and that's what it is. So and actually let me let me tack on to this. There's also a really great interview. I hope it's still on YouTube. It's with Jordan Peterson and one of his graduate students. This is a few years old now too. I think her name was Brophy, B-R-O-P-H-Y. She did a study on the origins of social justice ideology. And I think the video is called Where Do SJWs Come From? And in that, they talk about two different types. They also talk about two different types of social justice warriors, but they talk about them in terms of, um, they call them the PC authoritarians, which which I would say are the bad actors, mm -hmm. versus the, the PC liberals or the PC egalitarians, which I would say are the useful tools. And they they go through the characteristics of these two types of people. The PC authoritarians have a uh, low disgust sensibility, so they're easily easily disgusted, like authoritarians on the right. They mm -hmm. also do not have a high um, uh, uh, verbal cognition. They're not very eloquent speakers. And the PC liberals are much better at articulating beliefs. And, and they use, they use the well-intentioned to help make sense of this belief system that doesn't make sense. And you'll see these very well-intentioned young kids. I see the ones who get pulled into it, even in my little small town now, the ones who get pulled into it easily, who have a big heart, and they may be in a dark place, and this appeals to them as, as a belief system, and they start speaking on its behalf. 
and they start trying to do the mental gymnastics required to justify some of these hypocritical beliefs. And they do the explaining. They do the explaining for the bad actors. Isn't that, it's, it's kind of incredible. Vocal. They're able to vocalize. They're able yeah. to, to... They have a high verbal IQ. That's a lot more uh, palatable to the masses. Yes. Um, did you, was it one of those things like, wow, I really, I really like this, this worldview, this ideological position. And so I'm going to pursue this. Or was it just, you kind of, you just found yourself growing into it. Look at a lot of people who grew up in the church. They'll tell you, oh, I've been a Christian my whole life. I never even really realized I was a Christian. I just was. Yes. And it's like that. You don't actually sit down and go, oh, this is a belief system. Should I join it? Nobody does that. And in fact, when you, if you point out to a social justice warrior, look, like, I don't have a problem with you as a person. I don't know you as a person, but your ideology, your belief system is evil. I have a problem with your belief system. They'll go like, what belief system? They don't even, some of them, they've never interrogated it. They've never sat down and consciously looked at it and said, oh, this is a system of belief. Here's the core tenant. Here's, they've never looked at it that way. They just start adopting one tenant at a time. So the first, one of the first things, one of the first tenets of this belief system that I adopted was this lie that they push where they're trying, they try to redefine words. They're very obsessed with controlling language. So one of the first things they'll try to get you to do is to accept a new definition for racism and sexism. So they, they got me to accept that racism is prejudice plus power and that sexism is prejudice plus power. They say that they're redefining it so that we have a way to talk about institutionalized racism and institutionalized sexism. Right. But that's not true. Think about that for a second if you're a person who's been sucked into this crap. That's not true. We already have a word for institutional racism. It's institutional racism. We're It's already very specific. Right. Why would you take a more general term and, and try and muddy it and change it? Because what that does is it gets you to, without telling you this, they lead you to that next conclusion, which is that, oh, well, you have to be... Uh, you have to be white. You have to hold societal power to be able to be racist. Right. It's prejudice plus power. So only white people can be racist and only men can be sexist. That's what they, that's the jump you're making that they want to lead you to. Now then think about why would an ideology want to convince you of such a lie? Why would they want to convince you that it is impossible to be racist towards uh, white people? Why would they want to convince that it's impossible to be sexist towards men? Like what might possibly be down the road from accepting if we if we all accept that collectively as a culture, as if you if you indoctrinate several generations with that false belief, what is a possible bad outcome? <laughs> well, now, now, Carrie, like, come on, you're you're using hyperbole. I mean, like there's only been the one Holocaust and that was completely different. You couldn't possibly be saying that it would, it could happen that people could rise up to try and destroy all white people. I mean, because that's what you hear all the time. When you push back against this ideology that there's specifically, it's geared towards hatred of white, um, the amorphous white people, which is just a like, I'm not white, I'm European, and I'm a very particular form of European. And note, and then notice that because you're not, well, you don't get to paint all minorities by, okay, all minorities are, are the same. And then there's subcategories like black, Hispanic, Asian, all of those aren't the same either. They, they point that out, but it's okay to lump whites in. And when you point that out, they're, oh, no, 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 no. That couldn't well, possibly ever happen. Well, that, that's be, not where this is going. Well, to be clear, I didn't make any comparisons. I asked a question. It's not hyperbole to ask a question. What is a possible outcome of indoctrinating generations of children to believe that it's impossible to be racist towards a specific race? I don't have to use examples because history is riddled with examples. Exactly. There's not just there's not just one. There's countless ones. We know what happens. You know what happens. And you can ask a person that question and try to get them to do the thinking. Now, if they're indoctrinated in a cult, they're not used to thinking. 
Right. They're not used to thinking. So it's going to be uncomfortable for them because what they do is in any cult and in the cult of social justice, they give you a list of acceptable beliefs, ideologically pure beliefs. You're supposed to just yes. sort through these and spit out the right ones and spit out the right responses, but you're not actually using your brain. It was, it's like, I was in it for 20 years. <laughs> when you come out of it, you don't realize what you're doing slowly over time is you're caging your, your own mind. But when you come out of it, you do, you know, it, it's so different. It's like using muscles that have atrophied. <laughs> Like you're like, oh, this is like like a child. <laughs> I it it, it I is. I love the fact that you brought up you were in it for 20 years because go going back to before I started recording, I'm like, you literally this was a career for you. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> was there a retirement was there a retirement plan? Are you like drawing on your social justice warrior <laughs> retirement plan? I mean, no, no, no retirement plan. But I'll tell you, a lot of people make, they do make a career out of it. They they intertwine it in their career. So I did the same. A lot of people, my my cohorts, my age group, we came out of these elite colleges, elite. We went into fields like journalism, uh, entertainment in my case. Um, we went into, some went into politics, some went into education and healthcare. And we took it with us. And we tried to reshape our little sphere of the world and through, th with this ideology, we took it into our workplace. That's why you see all these corporations speaking it now. It's like, why is McDonald's speaking critical race theory? Well, they have enough people there, a, yep. a critical mass of social justice warriors now who are pushing this. And I, they, they like to infiltrate the HR departments and yep. they try and remake the world according to this ideology. And they're making money while they do it. I took it into I, entertainment, making money doing it. Yeah, and I, I've heard you talk about that so much, like like intentionally focusing on venues that would allow that kind of, not allow, but encourage that kind of conversation or that kind of uh, comedy. I, I've met servers in, in anything from chain casual dining to upscale restaurants who have told, been told they need to take implicit bias training to be good servers. Yeah, it's I, everywhere. It, it, like, <laughs> it, it's, I was telling the story the other day about uh, a guy who works in small town Minnesota, uh, literally uh, works in a very, very small, small town as a local police officer got fired because in his personal time on Facebook, he made a defense of white law enforcement officers saying they're not all racist. And, and, and not only that, the vast majority aren't, and that most of them are not guilty of implicit bias. And a friend of mine told me this guy's story. He's like, small town, it's very, like, yeah. we're talking like maybe 800 people working part-time, he has a full-time job, he works part-time as a as a cop for this little teeny tiny town, and he got fired. Wow. For arguing against implicit bias. Yeah, you're yeah. arguing against something that they don't, they don't uh, provide any evidence for, and they don't believe they should be expected to provide evidence for. And, and so, it's kind of amazing if you step back and look at it that people's lives can be affected in this way that he can be fired for challenging something that that they don't have evidence for evidence. Right. Yeah. um it, it's just it, it's it's completely uh it's sacrosanct is what it is is it's 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 sacred yeah that's why you don't have to prove you know it's the same it it's the same exact accusation that you know in our our, our, our friend carter yeah and who would say christians do the same thing they don't have they they can't prove the you know and i and i say this good naturedly because carter and i've had and carter's had the conversation with other christians i know like yeah. you can't prove there's a god and and that's why there's so much similarity. And I, I love the fact that you talk about this a lot. There's so much similarity between social justice 
advocacy and, and social justice warrior mentality between religion, not in particular Christianity. Right. But I, I level the accusation against Christianity all the time that we have to stop believing that there's no room for intellect within Christianity and no room for reasoning within Christianity because we are no different than if that's our position as Christians, we're no different than the social justice cult in that we, we don't allow people to think and reason their way through their faith and be able to give a defense for it. I actually, I feel pretty lucky because since becoming, I'm a pretty new Christian within the past few years and I haven't encountered that yet. I mean, I, maybe I'm just blessed with the church, the community I found in the church that I'm at, but it's all about exercising your intellect and asking questions and having conversations with people who don't agree with you. And right. so it's funny because sometimes I'll get, I, and I'm sorry, I was distracted for a second. I was looking something up that I, I don't want to forget to bring up in a second, but um, uh, the, my, my church is, uh, it, it's the, furthest thing from the stereotype I used to have about Christians. And I do, I know that that stereotype is based on something and I know that those churches do exist. I, I just wouldn't go to a church like that. Right. No. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I don't, I don't, uh, it's, I feel, it's, I feel, made, it's made my fight to find a church home very difficult. The, yeah. Honestly, since I became a believer and I've been doing this a few more years than you, but so I would like to so, plug real quick then if anybody's looking for a church home and they haven't found a local one yet, but you want to see some interesting online sermons, my preacher's amazing. His name is Bradley Helgerson and the church is called the church on the square and he puts all his sermons on YouTube. So check it out. Make sure you send me a link to that. I will. So I, I will link it in the video description uh, when we, when we put this up. Um, that's a very Minnesota name. Is Bradley from Minnesota? Actually, I think he is. A name like Helgerson? That's got yes. to be. Yes, he's from somewhere in the, in the Midwest. I think no, it might no, be. I, <laughs> no, I have to meet him. So, yeah. um, so, so here's here's Carrie Smith. Graduates, goes into her career field. She's she's a flaming justice social justice warrior. She's out there, you know, like everything is about social justice and uh, you know. Who and who would not hate misogyny and who would not hate racism right. and all you know? So you're on the winning, you're on the right side because you have all the right positions, and then all of a sudden, this rabid social justice warrior cult member is starting to, as they use the term, get red pilled. How does how do you move from from 20 years of that? that life and it's a lifestyle in a worldview how do you move from yeah. that from being a non-christian and non-believer christian into non-christian into social justice warrior to all of a sudden leaving that and then rediscovering christianity yeah well there's a vacuum there's, five minutes left. No, <laughs> there's a vacuum in between each of those belief systems and that vacuum gets filled by something mm -hmm. i i'm one of those people who believes that everyone worships something. I believe that, and my preachers talked about humans, the view that humans are designed to worship. And, you know, I've even had this conversation with Carter. I, he was here for my wedding this past week and I asked him, I said, what do you worship? And he said, maybe reason. And I was like, yeah, I think you do. I think he, I think he worships reason and maybe a few other things, but he, I think everyone worships something. And yeah. when, uh, when, if if you think i think if a person thinks that they that they can exist without putting something in that place of worship then you're deluded <laughs> i think that you're you're not but you're not very aware of what you do some people it's really common in today's society to worship the self narcissism if if a person tells me they don't believe in anything and they're just an atheist. A lot of times, Carter's, Carter, as an atheist, says this too. A lot of atheists worship the state. Yeah. A lot of them atheist. worship government. Atheist. State atheists, yeah, they worship government. Uh, a lot of them worship themselves. A lot worship um, uh, uh, pleasures. 
some people worship alcohol, some people worship, um, you know, gambling, whatever, whatever thing it is that, that controls them. Um, and so it, it, that's a, that's a long way of saying in that period in between when I was leaving social justice, I was searching for something without real, without being conscious of it really, but I was searching for truth because it, this is how, when you look back, you can say, oh, that functioned as a religion for me. But when you're in it, you don't realize that. And right. when you're leaving it, you don't realize that. But at the same time that I was leaving it, my mind was opening and I was starting to see all of these hypocrisies in the belief system and things I didn't agree with. What happened was it, 2016 election, it accelerated. And and usually with with my with social justice, it had been like a, a frog in a boiling pot of water where you didn't realize the water was getting hotter. But then all of a sudden they cranked the heat up. In 2016, after Trump won, I saw violence. I went down a, a, a rabbit hole on YouTube of videos of people that were presumably on my side on the left, physically attacking Trump supporters, bloodying them with bricks, chasing them outside of events, throwing eggs at them, mobbing them, disgusting behavior that made me cry to watch. And, and I was, I thought this is not who we are. I was, I was still in that denial phase. I'm like, this isn't who we are. How is this happening? What we well, need to put the brakes on. Like, why is the left doing this? Why are we attacking people and because trying? Okay. They're, they're horrible. Yeah. People. And you can, you can be mean and rude to horrible people. Yeah. You can hate Nazis, you can hate racists, and you can use violence against them. Well, they dehumanized people and they were pushing yep. lies about, and I also saw that happening. I did say that. When I tried to talk about it online, I was being told by people on my side, in the social justice side. I remember a social justice comedian, um, the, an atheist comedian. He sells himself as an atheist comedian. And not very funny, by the way, this guy. Uh <laughs> Sorry, that's me taking is a little dig, it, but it's is true. That, is that now Carrie saying not very funny? No, that was then Carrie saying that too. Oh, he wanted Carrie me to manage. Was... Yeah, he wanted me to manage him, and I did not. Um, but but he was in my circles, and I remember he was one of the most vocally at the time in support of attacking people, and he was trying to tell me these. It's okay. It's okay to physically attack these people because they're Nazi sympathizers. I'm like wait a minute, 63 million people, however many people it was that voted for Trump, those people were, I'm supposed to now accept that those people are Nazi sympathizers? What is wrong with you? There's something very dark in you. That's disgusting. You know who sounds like a Nazi? You do. And that, that it made me so <sighs> emotional. <laughs> Obviously, I still have a lot of emotion about it. it made me, but it, but it really, uh, it took something emotional like that to wake me up. And pe people ask a lot of times, well, how do you how do you help pull someone out of a cult belief system? How do you help pull someone out of social justice? Is there a book I can give them to read? Is there a video? And the answer is, like Jonathan Haidt talks about in The Righteous Mind, most people, I think he's right when he says most people make decisions based on their emotional mind. With the, He calls it, he says, your mind is like a rider on an elephant. And the rider is your rational mind and the elephant is your emotional mind. And most people, their elephant is leading. My elephant leads a lot of the time. I have to try and get my rider to lead. But most of the time, your elephant leads, and then your rider tries to justify things after the fact. And so um, I, I it, it was something emotional that appealed. Like, I saw these videos of people being attacked and assaulted in on my behalf, by my side. That startled me. That shook me. And I... I Again, it wasn't an overnight thing. I didn't wake up the next day after watching those videos and say, you know, I'm leaving social. It, it was the beginning of a crack in the foundation of my belief system. And that crack started leading over time to the whole house of belief falling down. And and that's really, you know, when you talk to people who are walking away from a dangerous mentality, they don't it's it literally not one of ever you ever i've never met a person who has walked away from a dangerous mentality whether it be some one of the christian cults you know or another cult or something like social justice or even like the the right the the allegedly right wing um 
racist organizations. It's never one of those, oh gosh, I just woke up one day and I realized that hating somebody for their ethnicity was horrible. It's, it's not like that. If you watch yeah. the, uh, the movie American H History X, violent, violent movie, horrible. Uh, I like no one should ever like ever go into that and, and, and think that it's going to be okay to share with your kids. But if you watch American History X, it, I know the message it was trying to send, but what you see there in, in the, in the lead character is, is that realization of, huh, something's wrong about this. Yeah. So it's actually a really good movie to watch for that. Yeah. And for that reason. And, but we need somebody to make a movie like that about leaving social, about leaving social justice. justice. You're so right, Todd. It's the same. It's the same thing. And, and this is something I think trying to talk to friends, people who are still in it. I know people who are still in it, who have a good heart, not like that guy that was trying to justify assaulting people. Um, but there are other people, there are comedians I worked with. There are people I know who are still in it, who have a good heart and trying to help them see that, look, I know you're in it because you want to, you pose racism and sexism, for example. And so do I. So on some very basic level, we have that in common. We both oppose racism and sexism. I think that your methods of doing so, this ideology that you've fallen into is the exact opposite of what you think it's doing. I think it, it furthers racism and sexism. I think it's an evil belief system. And I think you're making the world a worse place. But I know you don't see that yet. Right. And, it, and, and, and so helping them to see that this is no different from from another collectivist racist belief system like white supremacy. It's no different. It tells us that we must judge and treat people differently on the basis of race. Where, how is that a good starting place right. for ending racism? That's a horrible starting place and a horrible ending place. That's awful. Um, it, it tells us that that race is the lens that we must use to, 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 to look at a person, to judge a person, to treat a person. No. That's not how you end racism. That's more racism. You don't end collectivism with collectivism. You don't end racism with racism. You end collectivism with individualism. So I don't want to throw you off, but you said you had something you wanted to bring up and you were looking it up on your phone. And, and Oh, well, just about when we were talking earlier about how about 20 years ago or so when people my age who were indoctrinated with this, this stuff in, in college, when we were entering the workforce, we took it with us. And I remember reading recently something about uh, SDS in the 1960s, um, the Students for a Democratic Society. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had trouble finding it, but, but uh, they basically had a list of their long-term goals. Yep. Yes, in the 60s. And it was just like it was just like what we did. Their goal said, we want to move into science. <laughs> it was like, we want to send people out to move into entertainment. We want right. to send people to move into politics. They listed all these arenas, these fields of study, these fields of, of work, and they said, let's move in there and change everything from and, the inside out. And look where Bill Ayers is today. Yeah. And and, and I know you know this, but, and, and they got all of that from Alinsky and they got yeah. all of that from Gramsci. This is all, this is all Gramsci and theory. This is all Gramsci and Marxism. You know, it, yeah. it, it, people don't understand that it, like you, you mentioned communism and, and most conservative, most uh, libertarians, most Anarcho-capitalists, you mentioned communists, they're going to go, yeah, I hate communism. But you mentioned Gramscian theory or Gramscian Marxism, and they're like, well, what's that? Isn't that just communism? And I'm like, no. They're, they're, they, they spring from the same root, but they're, they're different. And the thing that makes Gramscian theory, Gramscian Marxism so dangerous is that the way it was implemented in the United States, it, go, it goes back to John Dewey. Like... You, you look at people, they're, oh, 
John Dewey invented the Dewey Decimal System, and he and he he uh, came up with the you know he helped with the formation of government schools. I'm like, yeah, bingo. Like, mm. yeah, bingo. That that was their whole goal. Was oh, what did uh, Gramsci say? We need the long, slow trudge of the institutions. Mm. And in those institutions, in their mind, media. You know, first it was the universities and the churches. And look where we're at. And and what you were saying, too, about people's hearts. That's why so many apparently Christian organizations have fallen to this mindset. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. we care. I mean, I don't want to be a Christian and, and not hate misogyny. I don't want to be a Christian and not hate racism. I don't want to be a Christian and not hate homophobia. And and so that's what they get you there. Well, yeah, and I think that's a part of, can I interrupt you for a second? I think that's a part of people not having interrogated their beliefs. If you have a Christian who's never really, into, especially if they were raised in the belief system and they've they've never left it and they didn't come to it intentionally and they've never interrogated it, the same way that a lot of social justice warriors have never interrogated and, and realized this is a belief system and here are the tenets and here's the core. They've never examined it. Right. A lot of I think I think the types of Christians or the types of religious people who who have supposedly have another system of belief, the, but fall prey to this. I think it's because they've never sat down and examined what they believe and why. They've right. just accepted it casually, and that's no defense against something like this. You can easily be sucked into another system of belief if you haven't come to your beliefs, if they haven't been hard worn hard one sorry and if and if you haven't really examined them and thought about like like building the foundation of a house you know i mentioned the foundation of my house of belief started to crumble and then the whole house came down yep. um if you haven't looked at those foundational beliefs and and consciously decided what you believe and why then it can come it can come down easily it's funny cuz i have people now who say stuff to me like uh, kind of resentful from a place of resentment. I think they'll say stuff sometimes in my interviews, like, Oh, you left one cult and joined another. And it's like, well, first of all, no, I've, I've, I've done the cult checklist for social justice and it, it checks off a lot of those boxes. <laughs> I've also done it for my current belief system and it doesn't check off those boxes. It doesn't discourage me from associating with people who don't believe it doesn't discourage me from asking questions um, it doesn't tell me to, uh, isolate and treat as heretics, people who leave the faith. Like it, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't check off those same boxes. Um, but it also, it also is something that I've come to very consciously, unlike social justice. Like I sat down and thought about every step of the way. What do I believe? If I'm going to build another house of belief to replace the one that I raised to the ground, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be present while the house is being built. I'm not going to have, I, it's not going to be something that's happening subconsciously that I'm not paying attention to. I want to see every beam and pier of that foundation. And right. I want to know what I believe. And I want to build it like the Bible says, on uh, you know, not on shifting sand. I want to build it on rock. And I want, I want to be strong in my faith and in what I believe. And I want to, examine it um and that's the way i think i think that everybody should carter who's an atheist he has examined his beliefs you know yep. he's examined them in that same way and and i think that's something we have in common though we have different belief systems we both believe in 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 looking closely at what is the foundation of your system of belief for interpreting the world and being in the world Anyway. Right. And that's, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up because, you know, whether it be Joshua from Disaffected or Carter or, you know, Mark Pellegrino, I mm -hmm. like I was I'm still sitting here every day. I'm like this close to sitting down with that interview that or that conversation that Mark and Carter had and going through a few of the things and saying, love both of these guys. Here's where they're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then Carter and Mark would, you know, like rip me to shreds because they're both far more intelligent than I am. But uh, but the thing that that makes Carter and Mark and Joshua stand out is not 
the fact that like Joshua has walked away from social, the social justice, especially LGBTQ stuff. And the fact that Mark is very vocal about his, his positions, even if it might mean uh, hindering his career as a, as a, you know, a Hollywood type, uh, it, what makes those three stand out or, or uh, James Lindsay or mm-hmm. Peter Bogosian or any of those is not, it's not that they're outspoken in and of itself. It's that they're so settled in their worldview that they're not afraid to speak out against something that yeah. is dangerous. And I think that's one of the things that that Christianity has as a great weakness. And I and I had said this with in my conversation with Carter, is that we've got this false image that Christians are supposed to be nice. Mm-hmm. And in, should we be loving and caring? Absolutely. But I don't have to be nice. That's different than being nice. Yes, absolutely. And well, Jesus was nice. I'm like, Jesus was not nice. No, he was not nice. <laughs> no. like, he was loving. He was loving, but he was also incredibly harsh. Like, yeah. like if you looked at one of your friends and said, and said, get thee behind me, Satan, nobody's going to go, oh, that was pretty nice of you. You know, like it's just yeah. not. And that's the difference is that Carter and, and James and Joshua and uh, Mark, they all have the ability because they're so grounded and rooted in their belief system, even in those places where we disagree, that they can come out and say the hard things. And we need Christians who are able to yeah. do that. And, yeah, who, and are strong, who are strong in their beliefs. Right. And who have examined it, like you were talking about, and, and said, uh, my belief system doesn't comport with this. You know what? We, we talk about the definition of truth all the time. You guys do. I do at, at different times. What's the definition of, of truth? That which comports with reality. Yeah. And, and, I, and go ahead, Carrie. Well, I think also um, it's uh, you just make me think. James Lindsay, for example, James Lindsay, who's an atheist, he speaks very effectively against social justice, against this bad ideology. And I've Maybe. seen him attacked online by a so-called Christian. I put that in quotes, a uh, preacher. There's a preacher there who, um, there's several, but there's one in particular who I tangle with quite a bit, uh, Kyle Howard. Kyle Howard is- Kyle Howard is not a Christian. No, he is uh, what I, a, wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's someone who I think is committing one of the worst sins. It, it, he, he takes the Lord's name in vain and, I'm, and what I mean by that is he puts the Lord's name on evil. He substitutes good for evil and evil for good. He's, he is selling social justice and he's trying to cloak it in God's name and cloak it in Christianity. Which I, is I agree. Thoroughly just, evil. And I've seen him say uh, he got into a back and forth with James Lindsay or some of his followers did. And, and uh, they were saying, you know, they were trying to shame Christians who were standing with James Lindsay. And, and I'm like, no, I don't play that. That's I'm not playing nice. If you want to put it that way, what you are speaking is not Christianity and you're not speaking truth. You're speaking lies. I don't care if you're trying to cloak it in God. James Lindsay is an atheist. Yeah, he is, but God can use anyone. And if he's speaking truth and he's speaking God and he speaks some truth, and when he speaks truth, especially about social justice, that's who's that's who I'm I'm agreeing with because it's truth. It doesn't right. matter to me that he's an atheist. He's speaking God, and and for I, I think that I think that we're in really interesting times now where you're you're starting to see this evil slip into the church and disguise itself as Christianity, and then we're you're you're seeing because we're living in such upside down world, you're seeing just very interesting alliances being formed between Christians and atheists who are fighting back against this between radical feminists and yeah. conservatives who are fighting back against this. I mean, that's really interesting, <laughs> you know? Right. So like, well, and I, and I, I, I read somewhere, I read something somewhere that said, whoa, that it's like, woe to you. If you've called, 
Oh, I, I'll read this verse to you. I've, in evil good. I'm like, I read that. I don't, is that? It's because I've been, I've been posting it a lot recently. <laughs> Here it is. Well, it's, in my, <laughs> it's in my bio now. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I keep dwelling on this verse lately because that's the times that we're in. Everybody yeah. talks about it being a clown world and upside down world. That's where we are. They're yeah. selling us, they're selling us lies and propaganda and they're calling it news. And then they're attacking news and they're attacking facts and calling it propaganda. It's like we are in the we are in that verse right yeah. now. <laughs> and well, and here's and here's the you brought up Kyle Howard. I've had tangles with Kyle. I know that probably surprised you. Um thoroughly evil man. I mean, yeah. I don't know him. I don't know his soul, but what he's pushing is evil. No, there's really evil. no, you cannot. And I, and I will say this without equivocation. I, I use the, I use a, the, the a, I draw a very stark difference between a, a confessing Christian and a professing Christian. There are a lot of people in the United States who are professing Christians because they were raised in the church or they go to church or they're even pastors. And then there's confessing Christians, and I don't mean you have to hold to a particular confessional position, the London Baptist Confession of 1689 or the Westminster or the Heidelberg Catechism, whatever it is. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those people who, when you look at Romans 10, and it says, you know, if you, and I'm going to paraphrase here, if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Christ is both Savior and Lord, you will be saved. That's it. That's that Greek word there for confession is homologeo, and it means to say the same thing. And that's like, if you could say the same things, one, about yourself that God says about you, which mm -hmm. prior to your conversion, you're a rotten person because <laughs> that's what, you know, that's why you need Christ. Then that's what it means to be that confessional Christian. But we have a lot of professing Christians who come in and do what you're talking about in the case yes. of Tom Howard, who come in, oh, I'm a Christian and and, and I speak for Christianity and in speaking for Christianity, you have to agree with critical race theory. You have yeah. to agree with all of these other critical theories, critical gender theory, critical sexual theory, all these. You have to. And you have to embrace all of these other things because, you know, Christianity is about about just accepting people as they are. And and if you if you fight against this stuff, then you're clearly not a Christian. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, and I'm not speaking for Carrie. These, these are these are these are Todd's words. Anybody who embraces critical race theory wants, or any of the critical theories, who claims to be a Christian, once they've started to learn about it, cannot claim Christ as their Lord and Savior because it's completely antithetical. It's it's to the it, belief system. It's absolutely opposed. And since we since we're talking about Christianity now and, and social justice, let me. And I've talked about how thoroughly evil i think it is what what kyle howard's doing let me recommend some people who i think are doing good and and who are talking about christianity and talking about this ideology samuel say yep. uh his his blog All is right, right. right w-r-i-t-e he's someone we had on um on uh deprogrammed on unsafe space pretty early on i love this guy he has an article um about social justice and the gospel and how the two are yeah. fundamentally opposed to one another it's a great piece i suggest everyone read it his name is samuel say s-e-y and then also um we've had on um uh oh monique dusen d-u-s-o-n from the center for biblical unity now she's interesting because she was a social justice warrior like me for 20 years like me but within the church yep she was someone who was who was pushing it and trying to remake the church with this ideology. Well-intentioned person trying to push it in the church who came out of it and speaks against it. Yep. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a few more. Chris Williams, who K Dub True, he's also yeah, a rapper, I'm, a Christian rapper. I'm actually yeah. friends with Chris. I know Chris. Oh, you do? Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, Chris, Chris went to church with some very good friends of mine, which is how I met him. And so I, 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 and I've been interacting with Chris for a while. Chris is a, a phenomenal mind. Very sharp, very sharp. Very sharp. And then uh, the fourth one I would suggest is Paul Vanderclay. Yeah. Paul Vanderclay has a YouTube channel and he does a lot of content about 
social justice and Christianity. And we had him on, on unsafe space as well, but there's a lot of great people uh, who are, like you said, who are not, who are not being nice, but who are speaking truth and who are strong in their beliefs. And some of them have come to very like Monique, very hard worn beliefs and, and have thoroughly examined and, and know and are strong in their faith um, who are speaking against this evil. I want to read one verse real quick, just because you made me think of this. We're talking about people who put on the cloak of God, especially people who are preachers and are pushing this evil ideology. It's it's the verse Matthew 18, 18, 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. <laughs> like it is not it a good very, thing what you are doing. It, it's it's very nice of, it was very nice of Jesus to say that. <laughs> right. He's speaking truth. It would be better for you to be drowned in the sea. What you were doing is awful. Right. You know, and so like, yeah, we're on the top of Christianity. We've talked about your walk into social justice warrior mentality we've talked some about your walk away and what the the cracks in the foundation were carrie jesus christ is your lord and savior yes how on earth do you go from being raised ostensibly in a christian <laughs> home to walking away to walking into social justice mentality having the cracks of that foundation whittled away to now you're in a church that actively teaches against everything that you believe for 20 years. How did you become a Christian? What happened? Well, uh, like I was saying before, there's a vacuum that, that opens up, I think in your, in your soul or your heart, there's a vacuum that opens up. If you leave one belief system, I think we're, like I said, we're designed to worship. And so, there, there was a vacuum there and I was looking for truth. That's what I've always looked for truth. I mean, even when I was in social justice, I thought I had found truth. You know, I thought this was the way, the truth, the life. I thought social justice was that. I mean, I could, I could, I thought that was the best way to be in the world. It was the best way to interpret the world. And when I started leaving that ideology, um, I was, I was looking for truth without realizing it. And I started going to a spiritual center. I was also in the middle of a personal transformation. It wasn't just an ideological one. You know, I, I was at a very low place personally, the, probably the lowest place in my life. I was going through a divorce. I was trying to figure out who I was and what I believed. And um, I was still drinking back then. I tried to fill that hole with alcohol for a while. Um, but I also, thankfully, was open-minded enough to, to open a door that I had shut a long time for a long time, and that was opening the door to God. I went to a spiritual center, and for me, it's the only place I would have gone is a very uh, open, sort of new agey kind of yeah. uh, a center, and it's a huge church in, in LA. It's called Agape, and the preacher there, Michael Bernard Beckwith, he draws on Christianity, but he, he mixes in other, it's sort of a mindfulness stuff that he mixes in and, syncretism. and uh, what's it called? Syncretism. Maybe. Where, yeah. I don't know that word. Christian, people bring Christianity in and they, they syncretize other, other religions and other belief systems in. Yeah. And it becomes more palatable to a person who, well, I'm not Christian. I'm spiritual. Right. Exactly. Not, I, I shouldn't be mocking. I'm sorry, but that's just it's no. But it is. It is, and I think that's the only door some people will go through. That's the only door I would go through. I would never have gone to a, a church like I go to now. <laughs> like at the beginning, I never would have. So I I went there, and uh, there, you, you know, you're, 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 you there's 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 Muslims next to you. There's Catholics. There's people from all different faiths who come together who maybe have left the faith they were raised in, but they're in this church and, and you're hearing God can, like I said earlier, God can speak through anyone. He can speak through an atheist, atheist. He can speak to you at any type of church. He can even speak to you. You could be at a church that's gone woke and is preaching bad ideology opposed to the gospel. And God can still find a way to speak to you. I believe this. And God spoke to me at that church. And he spoke through a donkey. He can speak through any jackass. Yeah. On stage, so. <laughs> 
That's great. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> That's great. When you um, use it, though. <laughs> I'll credit you. I'll credit you. That's really great. Uh, that makes me think of that Bible verse about how I also think a lot about that verse about uh, how God God chose the foolish to shame the the the, the smart. What is it? Uh, the foolish, God, the foolish shame the, the wise to the, shame the wise, and God the chose the weak to shame the strong. And yeah. that always makes me think of of when He uses That's, people that are jackasses. Yeah, yeah. or like you know any of us who are broken, anyone who or you know people were like, I think I think He was using donald trump in a way i think he i think he uses like kanye west i think he used kanye west and people want to say oh those people are buffoons it's like well god uses buffoons <laughs> like you know anyway uh i'm getting off subject so i went to that church and that never <sighs> happens with you by the way you never rabbit trail ever i don't like sarcasm <laughs> <laughs> It's a gift. You know, it's it's yeah. a Minnesota thing. I don't know. No, anyway, so you started going to that church. Um, yeah, I was going to that church and and that really was a place where that first time I went, God spoke to me and uh I had I had a moment there that if you are a Christian, you will know what I mean. If you're not a Christian, you'll probably think I'm a weirdo or write it off as some psychosomatic emotional reaction or what have you that's okay you can i maybe you're right you can you can call it that but i had a I had a moment there he was talking about how god wants to have a relationship with you and god wants to see the face that he gave you before your parents were born which is just such a beautiful thought it's like you're you're it speaks to you being eternal something eternal with you that's connected to God. And I had been a person who had for so long defined myself by my childhood and uh, uh, an abusive childhood and in, in my, my relationship to my mom. And so to hear that, this thing about, you know, the face Stop he gave it, me. emotional too. Yeah. <laughs> But God wants to see the face he gave you before your parents were born. It was it was sort of a a releasing of those bonds of your identity is something eternal that is not fixed to anything marked here on earth in time or with relationships. And and that was very a very freeing. Yeah, it made me cry. I was like something just it, in that sentence. Isn't that funny? It's a place you wouldn't go back to. That church? Oh, I yeah. probably would. Yeah, if I were oh. back in LA, I would go there. Oh, I was kind of, I was kind of like, for what you said about the the you know the, the church you're in now, the church on the square. Mm -hmm. Church on church the square, church on the square is completely different than that. <laughs> church on the square is very is is a Christian church. It's a Bible based church, and it is uh, not concerned with being nice. It is concerned with speaking truth, and. That church love, got and love, truth and yeah, love. yeah, truth and love, yeah, and and but but because of a lot of stereotypes that people have about Christianity and stereotypes that I had, I'm just saying I never would have gone through that door. It's a narrow right. door. It's like, right. uh, you know, the door I went in was a very wide door, mm -hmm. and it's too wide for me now. I wouldn't worship there regularly. No, but it, if I I would visit there. I wouldn't worship there regularly, no. And you and and I could just hear. I could hear the way you're saying it too. That you would recognize where there's some error. Yes. And it, and yet here you are sitting in a in a, a church that speaks the truth in love, but got, getting there through a very long process of having gone to a place where kind of everybody comes in. Yeah. And and hearing that one thing, which is really a throwback ultimately to what it means to be made in Mago Day in the image of God. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That like he what what did he say? I knew you in your mother's womb. I formed you and I knitted you in that in that space. And of course I'm paraphrasing now. And that 
that's what m- makes the intrinsic value of our humanness so utterly real is that it's not what we look like on the outside it's not our skin pigmentation it's not our our physical beauty or it's not our physical aesthetic it's not if i weigh 285 pounds or 110 pounds or 50 pounds or whatever it's about that intrinsic value of who we are having been made in the image of god yeah and that's what's missing from so much of the social justice mentality that guys like Kyle Howard and others have completely abandoned. They're literally saying that all of your value is wrapped up in what position you take yeah, and your skin pigmentation and whether or not you're an ally. The and least important things about you. Right. And that's, and so the thing that penetrated your heart and eventually led you, you know, now that you're in Texas, right, <laughs> sitting in a church that speaks the truth and love was the appeal to your imago day. Yeah, image that's of a God. great way of putting it. That's exactly what it was. And, and then it was a long path too. just so anyway, it wasn't like, so I went to that church for a while. And then even after I left LA, I listened to their live streams. They call them love streams. I used to share the love streams all the time. And, and then I you know that you need the cranky old Christian man in me is over here going. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Just I because love, I'd be like, that's too touchy feely for me. Touchy feely. <laughs> oh, I love that. And then I, I, uh, and then I went to, I found a spiritual center in Austin that had is cut from the same cloth as Agape. It was very small though, and I went there for a while, and then uh, I felt God pulling me, and I, I went to. I had a friend who, just like Carter, I had a friend who had been an acquaintance in the entertainment industry. We had gone to the Grammys together, but we weren't really very close. We had had some business dealings together. And then uh, she was someone who saw the changing nature of my posts on Facebook and, and she wanted to speak with me. And so we became good friends and she came out to visit. She had, and she was going through the same transformation and she, uh was what her eyes were open to the social justice stuff not that she had been in it but she was seeing it for the first time she also was experiencing a lot of hatred and not understanding why because she had been sort of politically disengaged and she voted for trump and uh is a woman of color who voted for trump oh, and heaven. then and then she started to hear all this hatred and was like, wait, why, why do people hate me? I don't like she was that disengaged that she didn't understand why people were talking such crap about Trump voters. And so and so we connected and, and she was coming back to her Catholic faith and she came out to visit me. And and I went to a Catholic church with her for a while. Now, I, I did that for a while. And I really I liked it. I got an appreciation for, I think, ritual and tradition. And but it still wasn't the home for me. I didn't. I didn't end up staying there. I, I went for a while. And then and then I had a friend who I started these civility dinners, which was, it, it's an attempt to bring people together of different beliefs and have dinner and try and reinstill some civility into our dialogue and our disagreement. Mm. And so I started doing those in Austin and I would have people who voted for Trump, people who voted for Clinton, non-voters. I would have Christians, atheists all coming together and one really amazing couple who started coming, they invited me to their church and they were evangelicals. So that ended up being my church home for about a year. I was, I was going to that church for a while. And um, then when I moved a little outside of Austin, I started looking for one closer to me here and went to a cowboy church. I, I tried a lot of different churches before. God, for some reason, put the most perfectly suited church for me right in my backyard. <laughs> and I went to the first service they opened during the pandemic. They opened their first service was during the lockdown in a guitar shop. And I just happened to see an ad on Facebook and I went and I'm like, wow, well, got, th- this guy is, his light is on. I see God in him. I hear it in his sermons. He's, he's speaking to my heart and to my mind. And there's something happening at this church and it, 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 that I was, I, 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 I'm so grateful for it. And, but the whole, I'm grateful for the whole journey. Like all those, I got something from each step of the way and I'm sorry, it's taken a while to answer your question, but I guess the point is, I love it. So 
you keep there's going. no there's no right way somebody asked the other day uh, a christian asked uh, um about my at the time was my fiance now my husband um said, said like what's his hang up and i'm like excuse me <laughs> like his hang up he doesn't have a hang up like i don't view it that way everybody has a different journey and a different path to god and they're at a different place they're at a different timeline god works with some people in a short amount of time and some people in a long amount of time but he works it's perfectly as attuned to god's time which is not like our time right. and and when i look at the path my path back to god it it causes a lot of emotion because it, on the one hand i i had to learn a lot of things the hard way but it was for re it was for good purpose right. it can be used for good purpose now when i talk about my old belief system when i talk you know i have uh, a unique hit everybody has a unique history and yeah. a unique experiences and talents that they can use for greater truth like for truth and right. and and so i i don't i don't understand it, the like what's a hang up or what's no god works in different a different timeline for every person and also i think speaks in a different voice to every person it's not the I, same i think that the problem for a lot of people who are even in good churches is that they they expect everybody's journey to be identical and yeah they they almost and it's that lack of the intellectual engagement that even even the the way we express our positions is going to be the same and and that's you know i was i was talking to the, the teaching elder of our church yesterday we had lunch together and and i'm like I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I'm harder on the church than I am on than than I am on atheists. And I and I said like I throughout the entire pandemic of the coof. Thank you for letting me use that word. By the way, um, <laughs> I I use it in all my videos now. I have people like the coof. What's the coof? I took that from the. I borrowed that from the nerdrotic guys. I love those guys. I'm borrowing they it from you and then them. <laughs> so, but I said through this entire coof pandemic, I said I, my my strongest and worst critiques outside of a few things to some people within um governmental agencies uh have have been labeled at compromising churches mm -hmm. uh, and and he's just like yep yeah, rightly so i said and the thing is is that a lot of christians like go you can't do that and i'm like if I can't critique my own belief system and people who profess to be in my belief system and critique them harder than people outside of it, then I should shut up. Yeah. And and that, and that's where Christianity is so so much of a failure right now. Is like, it, we're, one like I we we both said earlier, we're, we're all trying to be so nice, but but the second problem with that is is that we're not addressing these areas that need to be addressed, which is. The people within the, the 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 visible church, the broader church, are failing. They're failing. They're yeah. literally you like if your kids are in social justice and you raise them in the church, and you didn't raise them to critique every idea, even your own ideas. If you didn't raise them to do that, you have a problem. Yeah. You don't get to go and blame the university for that. You have to look inward and say, where did I fail? Now, still on the kid, still on that, on that, your adult child or whatever the case might be. But you don't get to point the finger and blame the world. You don't get to point the finger and blame Marxism. You have got to blame your failure in teaching them how to think independently. And, and that's where we're at. Yeah. And that's how you ended up where you are now is that you, you engaged thought. You engaged thought. Something you're saying is this is I encountered this. So so when I started first critiquing social justice, when I started leaving the cult of woke, I didn't leave it. Like I said, it wasn't an overnight thing. I was trying to salvage it at first. I was still trying to say, hey, we've got some things wrong, guys. Like, why are we now condoning violence and, and why are we doing this and that? And I was in censorship and I was I was trying to speak to that. And all all I got back in return, most of what I got back in return is, oh, you must be on the, you must be a right winger now because all you do is criticize the left. It's like, no, I criticize the left because it's my home. 
I should be criticizing the left, just like the right should take care of their problems and their extremists. They should be criticizing themselves. We need to take care of our problems and our extremists. We need to we need to be speaking out. We need to be the loudest voices against Antifa needs to be from the left. The right. loudest voices against social justice needs to be from the left. And so people don't like hearing that. It blew my mind that people don't. It's like, get your own house in order. But they don't want to do that. They'd rather throw stones at somebody else's house. And that's what I hear you saying about Christianity. Is people are like, oh, you're being too hard on Christians. You're being too hard on the church. That's who you should be hard on is you should be getting your own house in order. That's who you love. That's who you care about. That's where you live. Fix up right. your own house. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's what Christians what Christians do, especially the more you know conservative. Uh, I don't want to say traditional because I'm not traditionalist. I, you know, I don't I don't hold to tradition. Um, what, but what Christians do is we spend so much time looking outward into the world and saying, we got to fix this, we got to fix that, we got to fix this, and we got to fix that, that we fail to understand that that the closest way or the best way to address what's happening in the world is to fix that which is closest to home for us. Mm-hmm. And and that means we have to address, like like you said, we like you address the stuff on the left. That, that moved you in a direction different than what you would have imagined for yourself, but you started to address that. And we have to, in the church today, we have to do this. SBC is going through this right now. Yeah. You know, they just had another massive failure this yeah. week at their, at their national convention, at their national conference. Just a massive failure. And I have friends who are part of the conservative wing of the SBC who are like, it's done. It's over. Yeah. My it's friend too. Yeah. And... And they're doing the hard work now. They're looking at this saying, where did we go wrong? And if the church could do that, if if truly born again, oh, there's that word, truly born again Christians, people who truly believe in Jesus Christ and the, and the completed work that he did, were to start addressing these things in the church, we can recapture sp- sociology, society, culture, whatever you want to say, just through the, just through uh, fixing what's wrong in the church and then focusing on the preaching of the gospel. Yeah. And, and that, you have that to, go ahead, Carrie. You have to give people an alternative to culture. Right. Why would you want to recreate culture and put, and just put God's name on it? That's, they can get culture in the, in the marketplace of the world. Like they don't need if you're not giving them something different, if you're not giving them something that's full of God and truth, like why would they, why would you come to, why would they come to church to get social justice when they can get it in the, in the world? It doesn't, I don't even understand that. It's like, if you, I hear people being a new Christian, I hear people talk about churches appealing to the youth. Well, I don't real. I don't believe that the youth I don't believe that the youth are going to be brought in with flashy light shows and um, crappy ripoff of rock and roll music and, you know, like, like things of the world. No. Do not get me started. (laughs) (laughs) Why are you, you're, you're giving them a facsimile of what they can get better in the world. So why do that? Why dilute God's message through all this these trappings? And I don't mean I don't mean that you can't have fun and frivolity. I think you should have that. I think God wants you to have that. But don't frivolity. Right. You can have frivolity intermittently as Carter said. But don't make that your number one appeal. It's, it's not like, how do we bring in young people? Music and light, light shows. No. How do you bring in young people? Speak the hard truths in love. Speak something that's different than what they hear in the world. Yeah, there, I don't remember exactly who said it, but I, I use it a lot. Is that, and it's it's an old statement. That which you win them with, and this is direct reference to Christianity. That which you win them with, you must then also keep them with. Yeah. So if you're appealing to culture by looking like culture to get culture into the culture of your church building, the church building 
then the culture of your church building is the culture of the world and you have done nothing. You've done nothing. nothing. Done nothing. I, I, I can attest to the fact, like I, I, I'm a weirdo, Carrie. I know that that comes as a shock oh to you, but I'm one of those people. I literally go to college campuses and preach the gospel in the open air on college campuses. Wow. I go to a little town 20 miles away from me, and I will stand on a limestone boulder as people are riding by in this tiny little town on the bike trail, and I'll preach the gospel to them. And and I will have people who who are Christian come up to me and say, you're driving people away. And then I'll have non-Christians and atheists come up to me and go, I've never heard this before. I love that. And, and I'm not telling you yeah. that to puff myself up. No, but I love what you're telling me, which is that the Christians who are full of fear and telling you to stop. Yes. And the, and, and the atheists who are hearing you and going, thank you. <laughs> right. We, we may, we, look, I have one of my favorite college campuses to go to. I've got a really strong group of friends that I, Christian friends that I've met down there who are solid. But some of the best contacts I've had on that particular college campus, people who come back to me and like, oh, hey, we're glad to see you're back again this year, are the atheists that I've talked to in years past. Mm -hmm. Do we agree? Absolutely not. But look at the relationship between Michael O'Fallon of Sovereign Nations and James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian. Mm -hmm. If you haven't watched their stuff, here's an atheist philosopher and a Christian philosopher doing a show together, doing episodes together on so on the Sovereign Nations channel and podcast talking about what's wrong with the world when wow. other Christians would attack Michael for his position. Wow, yeah. That, it's, it's the being willing to be bold about your beliefs and looking at them and saying, look, I believe this and I believe you're wrong, but we can be friends and we can hash this out. Yeah, sure, eventually I want you to agree with me, duh. Why hold a position if I don't want you to agree with me? But that doesn't mean that we have to be alienated from one another. And the church is either completely so focused on fixing the culture around them that all they ever do is talk about everything the culture has done wrong without ever addressing what the church has done wrong. Or they want the love of culture so much that they're afraid to say anything that could be perceived to be judgmental or mean. They don't, yeah, they don't yeah. want to be called mean or bigots or what, you know, which they're going to call you that anyway. Do you know how many words I get called for criticizing social justice? You know, it's not oh, true. I can, I can imagine because I probably grew up. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It's not true. Right. And if you're a strong person and, and you're strong, in your faith, I'm, I'm speaking specifically to Christians here. Um, God is stronger than you. If, if you're if you're secure in that knowledge, like why does it matter to you what people call you or what people think about you? It shouldn't. Well, even if you're not a Christian, if you tend to be on the more conservative side or the more non-social justice warrior side, if somebody on the social justice warrior side calls you a Nazi, go, okay. <laughs> So they, hard. <laughs> they strip even... that word of meaning. Yeah, they strip it of meaning because they use it for they use it completely incorrectly, and and they project. Yeah. They they accuse everyone else of what they do. Yeah. Look, I I know you've got like a a three hour window that you have to like give to Carter today, and <laughs> yeah, and talking to me can be exhausting. Because I have to talk to myself every day, so I know this how has not been exhausting. But I do need to go now, probably. Yeah. So and, yeah. Uh, so since you need to, since you need to go now, I do. I I'm going to ask you to give me your closing thought on on people who who have loved ones that are out there with uh, multicolored hair and <laughs> putting up all the Marxist fist pictures in their windows and the BLM signs and, and all of that other stuff that's all wrapped up in the social justice warrior mentality who are going, I love them. This is not the person that I knew. Yeah. Give them some hope and, and then say goodbye in, in your very eloquent carry way. Uh, I'll try. Well, we get this question a lot and I know I know a lot. I've talked to a lot of people who are dealing with this, who've, who have kids maybe who've, who've, and sometimes spouses who've, who succumb to some of these beliefs, who've been seduced by social justice. And 
the best advice I've heard is from uh, this guy, this young guy who came out of it, who came out of social justice. And he talked about how he told me how when he was in it, he got pulled into a college like me. And when he was in it, he denigrated his dad. He treated his dad horribly. He accused him of being part of the white supremacist patriarchy, you know, all the all the things that they do that they say. And he said through it all, his dad was firm and disagreed with him and would let him know why and, and try and have try and have conversations with him, would ask him questions about what he believed. And but but most importantly, always treated him with love, even in disagreement. And so he never felt like he couldn't come back to his dad at some point. And when he finally started to wake up on his own time and to question some of the things he had believed, his dad was still there for him with open arms. Yeah. And that makes me think of if you're a Christian, obviously, like the prodigal son story. And so I would say you can be there for them and show them disagreement and love. Don't stifle yourself but also don't uh, don't try so hard to change their beliefs it, right. because then you're focusing, I think you might be focusing too much on controlling and, and they're going to come out of it in their own time if they come out of it. It's and, and like I said before, people make most decisions with their emotional mind, not with their rational mind. So there's no like number. If, it's, if, if you're approaching every interaction with them is like, let me just give them these facts and I'll show them. No, that's not going to work anyway. But you can love them. You can show them with your actions that you still love them, even though you disagree with them. What a what a powerful testament that is for them to to realize, wow, Carrie thoroughly disagrees with me and lets me know that she thinks my belief system's wrong and evil, even. I use that word. But she still treats me like a friend and and wants to hang out with me and do things with me and love me and like that. That's amazing if you can continue to do that for them. And and sometimes you can't do that because they'll cut you off. Their and their ideology encourages them to cut you off. Yep. And if they cut you off, just let them know you're still there when they come out of it, you know? Like if they come out of it, that you're still there and that you love them. And that would be that would be my advice. Um I think I think that you can treat it like they are a person possessed. You can be possessed by ideology and if you think of it that way, it helps you to, I think it helps you to still have love for the person, though you don't have love for their belief system or their behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Carrie, I um, I don't say this lightly. I, I love you. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I love you. I love what you're doing. And... Oh. I, I know, I know some of what I you're going through. I Carter that, and he gets all weird. So, um, oh, Carter's no. like, does, no, no, Carter's he, awesome. I love. Him he gets too, uncomfortable but. when you say that, when you say like, "I love you." Or lately, he's been dressing really spiffy, and that I, I was complimenting him. He doesn't like compliments. I, I know. But I'm, people will come locally. will come up to me. Oh, I watch you. On oh, I love your stuff, and I'm like. It makes you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. But no, Gary, I do. I genuinely love you. I love you in Christ. I, you. I love your heart. I love where you're at. Um, I'm looking forward to watching you grow. Uh, and I love the, what you and Carter do together on Unsafe Space. And um, between having Carter on a month and a half ago or whatever it's been now, uh, almost two months and having you on today. This has probably been one of the best experiences of my life. I had to like calm myself down. I was all fanboying before oh. that I got you and Carter to come on. And um, it, not, I know that. not for the clout, I literally want people in my circle to know who you guys are because I would much rather them watch you and listen to you guys because you do so much more work than anybody else I've ever run into. So um, thank you. So, okay. Um, thank you, Todd. Yeah. And, no, thank uh, you. Okay. And I'll see you later. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, absolutely. I'll see you on cool. the pod, on your live show. <laughs> okay, cool. Bye. Right. Bye uh, friends, family, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is, Carrie is why, um, and Carter too, are why these conversations are important. We don't have to hate 
people who have the social justice warrior ideological position. It is a cult, but we can love them for who they are and recognize that they are the image bearers of God, even in, in their wrongness. And so I would encourage you to tune into Unsafe Space. They've got a plethora of programs that they now do from uh, deprogrammed to they have a thing about self-defense to their regular uh, show, uh, which is just normally it's educational, um, informative and hilarious, uh, intermittent frivolity and all. It these are the things that we need to be doing. And so do not think for a minute that you cannot have these conversations. We have to be better than the other side. Have the conversations, speak the truth and love to these people. And, and remember, the ideology is our enemy. The ideological position is our opponent. The, they are people who need love. And they need compassion and they need reasoning. And both Carter and Carrie are incredibly good at those things. So until next time, as always, don't worry about your safety. Fight for your freedom and your liberty. Six Emperor Tyrannus.